Well, good afternoon, everybody. Call the Assembly to order, please. And the first item on our agenda this afternoon is item one, which is questions to the First Minister. And question one is Claire Griffith. The Octave. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Will the First Minister make a statement on support for claimants of the Welsh Independent Living Grant following its cessation? Thank you. May I begin, Llywydd, uh, by thanking those volunteers who have worked so hard during the very inclement weather, and especially the health service staff, and those who have worked so hard to ensure that there is less pressure on the NHS, local government and the emergency services. Well, we are providing full funding of £27 million to local authorities to enable them to meet the care and support needs of those who currently receive payments from the Independent Living Grant. People with disabilities who are in receipt of this grant tell me that their greatest concern is losing that element of independence that the grant provides them on a personal level. They appreciate the independence more than anything else. So what assurance can you give that they will continue to enjoy the same independence when that grant is brought to an end by the government? Well, we've been monitoring what the local authorities uh, have been doing and that monitoring will continue in the current situation in the transition period and from the beginning of that period in April of last year to the end of that period uh, we will be monitoring the actions of local government and we know that individuals assessed during that same period will also be monitored and I know that the Minister does know that we need to monitor the experience of individuals as regards to the process at present and the Minister is considering the way forward in order to ensure that there, uh, there is uh, assurance for those who receive the grant. Thanks for that partial clarification. The Independent Living Fund's pre-devolution was about giving individuals choice and control over how they spent their money, their fund, to live independently. Initially, the Welsh Independent Living Grant uh, worked that way, but unlike Scotland and Northern Ireland that have developed their models in partnership with the third sector, uh, you're requiring local authorities to meet with people receiving the grant to agree the support they need to do this, which, which the Welsh Independent Living Grant uh, save, or save the Welsh Living Independent Grant campaign says, uh, independent living is a rights issue and closing the Welsh Independent Living Grant is a betrayal of disabled people, our families, friends, our staff and our community because it takes their voice, choice, control and independence away from them. I know that the leader of the campaign met Hugh Ranker davis uh, in January, uh, and the leader of that campaign subsequently said this was probably the most important meeting of his life. That's how important this is. Will you, at this final point, please listen to this community and recognise that independence means giving them choice and control and not having to agree how they should spend their money um, with well-meaning um, uh, experts in County Hall when they are the real experts in their own lives. Well, can I, I mean, in terms of uh, how we got to where we are, there was an advisory group, as the member will know, which recommended providing future support through local authority social services. Now, the principle behind that was to ensure that all disabled people in Wales were supported to live in the same way and to ensure that the finite funding, let's remember that transfer from the UK government, is used directly for that purpose and not on the operating costs of separate arrangements for only some disabled people. We've made sure in Wales that every penny of that money has gone to recipients. Uh, that has not been the case elsewhere in the UK. Ricky Howells. First Minister, I've been contacted by a number of constituents who are also concerned about the future working of the grant. My constituents are not concerned as to where this funding comes from, whether it's Welsh Government or local authorities. All that concerns them is that they will be given the same level of support. So, um, What can the Welsh Government do to monitor this new system to ensure that local authorities continue to provide that level of support? Well, that monitoring is uh, continuing. Uh, we know that local authorities had reviewed or were in the process of reviewing the future support needs of just over 350 of the former ILF recipients in uh, Wales. 
Uh, out of these, just over 30 had already agreed and were receiving their future support, either direct from the authority or by receiving direct payments in order to obtain their support uh, themselves. Now, there is a need, of course, to continue <coughs> with the monitoring uh, arrangements. As I mentioned uh, earlier on, we want to monitor recipients' experience of the process, uh, and that is what the, uh, the, the Minister is considering at the moment in terms of how that might be taken forward. Thank you. Caroline Jones. Dr. Prefere. Uh, First Minister, many local authorities appear to be struggling to meet their obligations under the Social Services and Wellbeing Act. For example, many carers across the country have not received carer assessments. The end of the independent living grant places additional pressures on local authority social services. And First Minister, can you guarantee that those in receipt of the independent living grant will receive support that is equal to or better than the support they currently receive once local authorities have to provide that support? Well, the money has been transferred to, uh, to, to local uh, authorities. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, the level of care remains, if not uh, as least as good, rather, as it has been in, uh, in the past. And I remind the member, of course, that the amount we spend on social services per head in Wales uh, is significantly higher than in England. Question two, Neil Hamilton. Officer. Will the First Minister provide an update on progress to lower the minimum age for voting in elections in Wales? Well, we consulted on lowering the voting age for local government elections recently. That change will be implemented for the next elections, uh, given effect through the local government bill in the autumn. And I know the Llywydd is uh, consulting separately in respect of elections to the Assembly. I thank the First Minister for that reply. Um, there are strong arguments for reducing the voting age to 16, but would the First Minister agree with me that consistency is also an important element in the law? And if somebody is adult enough to be able to participate in choosing the government of the country at the age of 16, they should be able to drive a car lawfully, to decide for themselves whether to get their bodies tattooed or pierced. They should be able to buy alcohol lawfully. They shouldn't be subject to any rules on film censorship and so on and so forth. If we're not to have any consistency across the whole range of the law, what possible justification could there be? Well, there's, there's no consistency in that case. Uh, no, I believe that 16-year-olds uh, are well able to uh, vote. They're able, for example, to give their consent for medical procedures. Why then should they not be able to form their own minds, make their own minds in terms of who to vote for? They can't drive till they're 17. They can't consume alcohol till they're 18. They can't be a competent driver till they're 21. They can't, drive, they can't ride any motorcycle of any engine side till they're 24. Uh, there are inconsistencies, of course, but nevertheless, to my mind, 16 is an appropriate age, and the Scots showed this in their referendum uh, for young people to be able to vote that. David Meldy. First Minister, perhaps you've noted that uh, in Scotland, in the uh, um, referendum uh, on Scottish independence, the number of 16 and 17-year-olds who voted was 75%, uh, compared to 54% for the age group that, that just after that, 18 to 24. And a very similar death differential was present in the 2017 Scottish local elections. And do you agree with me that uh, ingraining a habit to vote early has, offers great benefit to society and allows us to focus on the, uh, the responsibilities uh, of citizenship, but also our ability to influence what goes around, uh, on, around us in, in the world in which we live? Absolutely. In Northern Ireland, in many years gone by, the slogan was vote early, vote often. Uh, the second bit of it, I suspect, we need to leave out, but it, the figures speak for themselves. The fact that uh, 16 to 18-year-olds uh, turned out at a far higher rate than those in the immediate age group beyond that shows how enthusiastic they are, how engaged they are with the political process, and how important it is that that sense of engagement continues as they get older. Simon Thomas. Uh, Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer Supply Cymru supports extending the franchise to young people at 16 and 17 years old, certainly. But we want to encourage people to vote in bigger numbers, and to do that, we need to give them good reasons to vote, and you can't just expect people to vote because you've given them the right to do so. So in your proposals for reforming local authority elections, where are you putting the priority? Is it by ensuring that all votes count by a proportional system? by changing the voting system, different days, electronic voting, voting using different methods, where do you think you will not only get young people to have the right to vote, but how will you encourage them to vote too? 
Well, there is scope to consider the methods that people use to vote. For example, there's no reason why every election has to be on a Thursday. Why can't we have elections on the weekend? That happens in a number of uh, other countries. I mean, historically, Sunday would be difficult in Wales, but voting happens on the weekends in a number of countries where more people can go out to vote. In time, I'm sure we will see people being able to vote electronically. Of course, there are issues regarding the security of doing that, but I'm sure they will be resolved. What is crucial is that we ensure that people want to vote, that they understand how the system works, that they desire to vote, and then that the system facilitates that. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. First Minister, the uh, proposals announced by the Welsh Government in January to lower the voting age to 16 in local council elections achieved wide cross-party support. And as the Cabinet Secretary for Local Government and Public Service has stated, local democracy is all about participation. First Minister, it is our duty to ensure the political rights that we bestow to all our children are allied with commensurate political activity and literacy. What actions, therefore, can the Welsh Government take to ensure that every Welsh child, wherever they are born and educated in Wales, has access to comprehensive and universal civic education at the heart of their education to ensure that they are politically literate on the governance of Wales and the United Kingdom? Well, we are developing a new curriculum for Wales, uh, and one of the four purposes of the new curriculum is that uh, young people leave education as ethical, informed citizens who are able to understand and exercise their human and democratic responsibilities and uh, rights. Uh, and, of course, giving, uh, making sure that happens in practice will be an important part of the curriculum, because we know uh, that education is about qualifications, yes, but it's also about developing the whole person and the whole person's knowledge of society around them. Thank you. We'll now turn to party leaders' uh, turns to question the First Minister. And the first up today is the leader of Plaid Cymru, Lee Ann Ward. First Minister, the media has reported today that at least 271 highly vulnerable mental health patients have died over the last six years after failings in NHS care, and that 136 NHS bodies have been given legal warnings by coroners. As is often the case, the report refers to uh, patients in England and Wales. Can you tell us, has any Welsh NHS body been subject to a legal warning by coroners regarding the death of a mental health patient? I'm not aware of one, but I will write to the leader of uh, Plaid Cymru with, uh, with more information on that. OK, thank you for that. There have been uh, many calls for an inquiry into these deaths, including calls from your own party. Now, we know that there have been failings in mental health care in Wales. We can all remember the Tawel van scandal. So I don't think there's any room for complacency on this question. Suicide rates are higher in Wales than they are in Scotland and England. Yet we also know that a minority of people who lose their lives have had contact with mental health services in the year prior to their death. This suggests that the mental health needs of all, but uh, possibly young people in particular, are not being met. Can our public services be more proactive in identifying and supporting people who are experiencing mental health crises to get help earlier? And do you have an access problem with your mental health services? I think there are issues with certain sections of the population not accessing services, uh, not wanting to, uh, uh, or not knowing how to, to uh, or not recognising uh, where they may have um, uh, symptoms that um, imply a negative state of mental health. Of course, through the schools, we have a support system now that helps uh, young uh, people, uh, and we would encourage GPs as they talk to, um, to people who come to see them perhaps with physical ailments to actually try to identify uh, whether people whether there's something deeper that is affecting uh, the, the uh, a person's overall state of health. I think you can do much more than that first minister. We know the children and young people with mental health difficulties go an average of 10 years before between first becoming uh, unwell and getting any help. And many of us here in this room I'm sure will have casework of patients who have had to fight to get any support at all. Now, I've got reason to believe that the number of people detained by the police under Section 136 for their own safety, uh, which are due to be published soon, 
will have gone up dramatically. I've also been informed that because, uh, that, that because some patients are not deemed to be at immediate risk, despite having been sectioned, they can be waiting days for transfer. Service capacity is clearly inadequate to deal with crisis, and reducing the usage of Section 136 has to now be a priority for your government. I will come back to this issue when those, publish, those figures are, are published, but wouldn't you agree with me now that it is a good time to have a wider inquiry into our emergency mental health system to identify these failings, and isn't it time to stop pretending that everything is fine when clearly these figures demonstrate that it's not? Well, I think it's important to wait to see what those figures actually show, uh, and then on the basis of what we find to, uh, to see what action needs to be, uh, needs to be taken. Uh, in terms of, uh, of mental health in Wales, we've seen the provision for children and young people improve substantially with the extra money, uh, eight million if I remember, that went into uh, those services and of course uh, what is being done in schools to uh, assist the young people as, as well. Uh, in terms of, as you mentioned, figures that are yet to come out, I think it's important to wait until those figures are out and then make an assessment of what more needs to be done in order to bring uh, the, the figure down those who are subject to Section 136 uh, orders and, of course, those who uh, tragically take their own lives. Thank you. Leader of the Opposition, Andrew Gold. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Deputy President. Uh, First Minister, I join you in your comments earlier uh, when you answered question one over the heroic efforts of the emergency services and everyone over yeah. the winter weather that we had uh, back last Thursday. And uh, there's been some heroic stories, but also uh, some heartwarming ones as well. Uh, but equally, what boils down to the facts that local authorities and health boards and other public bodies are facing once the clean-up operation is complete is a rather large financial bill that will land in treasurer's departments, the length and breadth of local authorities uh, across Wales. Uh, what discussions, if any, at this very early stage has the Welsh Government had with public sector bodies, health boards and local authorities in helping them meet this financial uh, bill, which they weren't expecting uh, this late in the winter? There, there have been, there have been, uh, well, uh, there have been discussions uh, with local authorities. At this moment in time, we have asked local authorities to quantify uh, what the, the extra pressures might be in order for us to better understand the situation. I take it from that that there will be Welsh Government support coming forward for local authorities, First Minister, uh, in particular uh, some of the ones here in the south which seem to have had the biggest quantity of snow dropped on them. Uh, but I would like to ask you the question about the National Procurement Service that the Public Accounts Committee uh, looked at yesterday and the Auditor General has highlighted as being particularly poor value for money for the Welsh Pound. When it was first brought forward, the then Finance Secretary to the Welsh Government uh, said that this was going to be a model, a collaborative model model to actually deliver savings in public procurement, of which £4 billion of public procurement goes on here in Wales. Uh, the initial sum allocated was to try and save money around the billion pounds of public procurement on electricity costs and other costs uh, that are met. It was deemed as a very Welsh way to meet Welsh businesses' needs and also deliver value for money for the Welsh pound. Well, virtually on all accounts, it seems to have missed its goals. What are you doing, First Minister, as a government, to either make this system work better or actually reform it totally so we can get better value for the Welsh pound? Well, first of all, it has to be said the MPS hasn't lost money. Uh, it's not yet at the point where it can pay for itself from uh, levy subscriptions, but the service is on target to secure the public purchasing services envisaged. That's about £40 million so far. The MPS actually belongs to its 73 members across the public uh, service. It is governed by an independently chaired board comprised of representatives of the uh, membership. We have hosted the service and we have supported it financially, but we don't actually own the MPS uh, alone. I can say that uptake of MPS frameworks has increased steadily since it became fully operational in 2015, and it's still increasing, and indicative figures for spend uh, for 2016 was 234 million, an increase of over 50% of the previous year, and that means indicative savings of 14.8 uh, million. Uh, so we know that the uh, service is growing, but it wouldn't be the case to, to say that it's lost money, uh, but it's not yet in a position where its levy subscriptions are covering its costs. 
Well, First Minister, it's unable to pay the initial capital that you made available to it of £6 million. Of its running costs, its annual running costs of £2.5 million. In its first year, it was only able to attract £330,000 of levy money, as you put it. Uh, it's missed virtually every target that was set at its, at its first year. It's now in year three. Uh, by any measure, this what could have been an exciting uh, national pub procurement service, uh, actually delivering real value back to the taxpayer, has failed to achieve its goal. And if you look at Welsh Government procurement, only 32% of its own procurement is localised here in Wales. Uh, but with your document, Prosperity for All, you talk about delivering greater payback uh, to communities across the length and breadth of Wales. Well, using the procurement service, you failed in its first three years. How are you going to actually meet the policy initiative that is in your Prosperity for All document with obviously delivering that Welsh pound back to businesses? We're confident that the MPS is on time. Target. What the NPS needs to consider is whether to increase the subscription in order to provide more revenue for itself to cover those costs in the future. Uh, but we're confident that it's on course to, uh, to meet its uh, target. And as I say, the public purchasing savings that are envisaged uh, as part of that target, we believe we will meet. And that uh, has, what we do know is that around £40 million pounds has been saved so far through the procurement service. And the leader of the UKIP group, Neil Hamilton. Presiding officer. Uh, all members, I'm sure, are pleased, albeit in varying degrees, to see the return safely of the First Minister from the United States of America. I read the written statement which was published this morning by the Welsh Government of what he did on his trip there. And I was quite surprised to see that there was no mention of any meetings with members of the United States Government administration. Um, and on the very day that President Trump announced that he was intending to see tariffs introduced on steel from all parts of the world. The First Minister was meeting the person who lost to President Trump in the presidential election, Hillary Clinton. Um, shouldn't the First Minister be more interested in playing power politics than the politics of impotence? Uh, well, I'm not sure whether the, uh, the leader of UKIP thinks I should have broken down the door of the White House in order to demand uh, a meeting with the President of the US. It doesn't work that way, I can, uh, I can assure him. Uh, but, of course, the, the issue of steel tariffs draws a, puts a very big hole in his view of the world, the post-Brexit world. Because we were told by him and by others that the way was now open for us to do a deal, a free trade uh, agreement with the US. And yet the, one of the first things the US has does is impose tariffs uh, on steel, which we actually export to the US. Not a very friendly action, is it? The First Minister knows that the United States' uh, concern about steel exports to the United States is not with Britain, because actually there's been an 11% reduction in the volume and value of steel that uh, is exported from the UK to the US in the last two years. The quarrel is with countries like China that produces half the world's steel and where there's massive ex excess capacity equivalent to the entire consumption of steel in the United States over one year. Countries like Vietnam, Canada, which exports to, uh, to the United States ten times as much steel as we do. Uh, and the President is concerned about the effect of NAFTA with Canada and Mexico. We happen to be caught up in the slipstream of all this. And, and, the, and the, response, the response of the European Union to the President's announcement is likely to be disastrous whilst we are within the customs union because the European Commission now says it wants to retaliate by introducing tariffs on cars, perhaps, and other um, manufactured goods, which could have massive impacts upon British workers' jobs and Welsh workers' jobs over many parts of the country. If we had an independent trade policy outside the customs union of the EU, we would perhaps be able to strike our own deals with other countries, in particular the United States, which is our biggest single trading partner apart from the 27 countries of the EU. Well, let me try and uh, educate him. Uh, first of all, US businesses want to see free trade. That much is true. The US government does not. It does not. These steel tariffs are being imposed on all countries. Uh, he may be right in saying that China and other countries are the main target, but this is a blunt instrument that's being used against all. Uh, no one has said in the US administration that the UK will be exempt in some way or the EU will be exempt in some way. This is a tariff against all. 
Now, he then criticises the European Union for suggesting that there may be retaliation. What does he expect? Yeah. Is he saying that if the UK was not in the EU, there'd be, there would be no action by the UK government? Because if, that's, if he wants a definition of impotence, he's just given it. The question is whether we should attempt to solve these problems by diplomacy and sensible uh, talking to uh, other parties or engage in the kind of megaphone bellicosity that has come out of Brussels in the last few days. Uh, and there are very serious issues at stake here. Uh, other countries like uh, Germany and Spain export far more steel to the United States than Britain does. So Britain is not the cause of the current problems and concerns in the United States. And whilst it's true, the announcement which has been made so far is on the basis of this tariff applying universally throughout the world. The details of what's proposed are not yet published, of course. And those are, are up for negotiation. The US Commerce Secretary has said as much. So I'm, I'm, I revert to the first question I asked the, uh, the first minister. Does he not think it would have been sensible to open some channels of communication, uh, even if it wasn't at the level of the President of the United States himself, but who is very pro-British, it's obvious from the things that he said in the time that he's been in office. Well, members can laugh, members can laugh, but the United States is globally a vastly important influence upon the economy, and in particular uh, on jobs and the livelihoods of people in this country. We should surely want to get on as well as we could with the leader of the free world and with one of our most important trading partners. Well, he does want megaphone bellicosity without any sense of irony and blames Brussels for it. Uh, I have to say, uh, the reality is that the, US, the current US government, and I, I don't believe this is a view shared by US businesses at all, nor the, those who invest in Wales, the current US government want to, wants to impose 24% tariffs on steel from the UK. I agree with him. Uh, the UK is not the main uh, target for these tariffs, but it's caught up in it anyway. Now, the Prime Minister herself has spoken to the President to no effect at all in terms of these tariffs being, uh, being lifted. <laughs> now, is he really saying that if the US imposes tariffs on goods coming into the US, that the UK and the EU should do nothing at all in response. I'm afraid that's not the way the world works. I prefer to see a situation where the US has uh, free trade with, freer trade with the EU and, uh, by definition, the UK, but it, it may have escaped his attention that the US has the most protectionist government it's had for many, many decades. It is not interested in free trade deals that are not wholly of benefit to the US. When I was in the US, one of the themes that emerged was that the NAFTA negotiations are based on the US demanding everything for itself and no uh, flexibility as far as Canada and Mexico are both concerned. You cannot be a protectionist government on the one hand and then say you want to have free trade on the other. I very much regret the announcement that was made by the US president in terms of steel tariffs. It may have an effect on the Welsh steel industry, but to sit back and do nothing is the most impotent response imaginable. Thank you. We now move back to questions on the order paper. Question three, Mark Reckless. Uh, will the First Minister make a statement on progress made in promoting Welsh trade with the United States of America? Yes, I refer the member to my written statement, which was issued earlier today. Now, the First Minister went to the United States promoting a, a free trade deal between the, the UK and the United States. Uh, he came back saying uh, we'd have to leave it to the EU. Isn't the truth that his uh, policy of a, a new customs union with the EU is the worst of all worlds, in that we would have no independent trade policy, yet we would have no say and no vote over the EU's trade policy? As with Turkey, the EU would set our trade policy and we would have no say. The US or Russia could specifically target UK exports and we would have no power to respond. How on earth would that be in our interests? Well, uh, so, size and mass is important. The UK is just 60 million. The EU is far, far bigger. The US is far, far bigger. We are surely in a better position when we work with other countries in order to develop a common goal. That seems to me to be perfect uh, common sense. But I have to say to him, he mentions the customs union. Once again, once again, I say in this chamber, offer a better alternative to the customs union. None has been offered. And secondly, solve Ireland. How many times have I said, I was saying it three years ago in this chamber, that Ireland was at the heart uh, of the problem when it came to a deal between the UK and the EU. Nobody, nobody has come forward with any suggestion 
that involves the, the possibility of an open border between North and South in Ireland, and yet still have the UK out of the customs union and the Republic inside the customs union. That would create a situation where smuggling would, I mean, smuggling would be right. There's no question about that. That is the question that was never answered in the referendum, hasn't been answered now, and still has no solution, apart from the obvious solution, which is stay in the customs union. Adam Price. Um, during your meetings with representatives of the government of Quebec last week, did you have an opportunity to discuss the veto that they have in Quebec over trade deals, international trade deals? You, in your comments to date, have said that you want Wales to have an influence, but not the kind of veto that territories of Canada and other European regions, such as Flanders and Wallonie, have. Have you changed your view given your visit? It wasn't raised during the discussions. Of course, the Quebec government is one that believes in the unity of Canada, but they don't view it as any kind of a problem. But of course, one of the things I did discuss with them was the system of sovereignty, a shared sovereignty, which exists in Canada. And that is a system uh, which, in my view, should be considered in the United Kingdom. First Minister, the leader of the UK group has already raised the issues that President Trump tweeted about the trade traps on steel. Uh, unlike him, I and my constituents, many of steel workers, have deep concerns over the contents of that tweet and the implications it has on the steel industry. Will you actually raise, as a government, with the UK government, as much as possible, actions to be taken within the UK to protect the steel industry because the costs to the UK steel industry is maybe 10% going out to the US states because of Tata, but that 10% has a major financial implications for the steel and the implications for Port Albert. We'll therefore protect the steel industry as we can and make sure the UK government does it and works with the EU this time rather than hinders it in actually addressing this issue. Absolutely. I know that a letter has gone from UK uh, steel to the UK uh, government emphasising this point, saying that uh, the obvious point that whatever is uh, not able to be exported will seek to find a market within the EU. Uh, and that will inevitably mean a depression in the price of steel, and uh, that will have an effect on all European steel makers, including, of course, those in, in Wales. Now, I very much regret uh, the blunt imposition of tariffs that has been uh, imposed by the, the US government. Look, I have argued for tariffs in the past against steel from China. I've said it in this chamber. But the whole point is you look to be selective uh, in order to make sure that you protect your industries against those products that, that carry the greatest risk. Welsh steel is not a risk to US steel. It's not a risk to, to American security. It's not a risk to uh, the US steel industry because we produce products that, uh, by and large, are not manufactured in the US. And yet here we have uh, the US government trying to use the blunt instrument of a tariff against all goods coming into the US. And that is a point that, 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 that uh, we have made to the UK government. Uh, this is something that's not acceptable. In fairness, the UK government has accepted that point. And we know that the Prime Minister has spoken to the, uh, the President of the US, expressing her great concern at what's being proposed. Question for David Rowlands. Yeah, uh, uh, will the First Minister make a statement on ambulance response times across Wales? Well, we expect the Welsh Ambulance Service to work with partners to deliver sufficient emergency ambulance cover to ensure all patients who require an emergency response do so in a time commensurate with their clinical need. Well, I thank the First Minister for that answer, uh, but does he feel that it is unacceptable that one of my elderly uh, constituents, after suffering a fall, had to wait <coughs> over 10 hours for an ambulance to arrive, this before the recent inclement weather? During this time, she was advised by response staff not to move in case she exacerbated her injuries. Dutifully, she lay on the bathroom floor until the ambulance arrived. I would like to state here that the care she received from the ambulance crew once they attended was excellent in all respects. Nevertheless, does the First Minister not agree with me that it is totally unacceptable that in the 21st century Wales a patient has to wait 10 hours for ambulance response? It's very difficult to offer an answer uh, to the scenario that the member has uh, posed uh, because I'm not familiar with, with all the facts. However, I, I'd be more than happy to investigate this for him if he were to write to me with further details uh, to see what happened on in this. I, I have no reason to doubt what he's saying, of course, but in order for me to give him a full answer and his constituent a full answer, if he were to write to me, I will provide that answer. 
Green up your with. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. A specific question on waiting times during the bad weather that we've just experienced. We are aware of the particular pressures put on the ambulance service because of the snow. I've heard one report, particularly concerning report, about the impact of waiting a very long time and the impact that had on a specific patient. Now, heavy snow isn't something that happens on a weekly basis, but neither is something that is entirely exceptional. So can the First Minister refer us to information that provide us with assurances that the ambulance service does plan as much as possible in order to cope when we do experience circumstances of extreme weather as we had last week? Well, if I give you some of the background and then go on to say what actually happened during the bad weather, there was an increase in the number of calls, as one would expect. There were 103 red alert calls on the Sunday, which was 20% higher than the previous week. So there was an increase in calls, as one would expect. So the ambulance service then worked very closely with the health boards and their emergency service partners through the Gold Command, because that is how it is resolved and coordinated, in order to ensure that every resource is used to support them. What does that mean practically? Well, a 4x4 four four vehicle and, of course, the air ambulance, the helicopter, to ensure that they can reach people that needed emergency treatment over the during last week. And so what happens is the, that the response is coordinated through gold commands to ensure that all the emergency services work together to help each other and the public. Thank you. Just, sorry, I was just listening to the end of the translation, which is slightly behind you. So. Um, question five, Mike Hedges. Uh, when will the First Minister make a statement on the role of universities in Wales as economic drivers? Through their teaching and research activities, Welsh universities are contributing to the wider prosperity and well-being of Wales raising the country's profile internationally and attracting investment and of course they have an important role to play in delivering our economic action plan. Well, can I thank the First Minister for that response? Uh, across Europe, North America and parts of England, university actors major the drivers of economic development and not just as major employers. For example, Mannheim has the Mannheim Centre for Entrepreneurship and Innovation that provides a founder and incubator platform for students, young entrepreneurs and investors. Aarhus has, like Cambridge, a research park fostering innov innovation and employment. Does the Welsh Government have any proposals to emulate those two successful uh, European cities within the two city regions of Wales? Well, well I, I would argue, of course, that they are already in place to a great extent and are being developed. If we look, for example, at the Menai Science Park development around Bangor University, it's one example, uh, an example of collaboration between government, industry and uh, Bangor University uh, itself. <coughs> Other examples? Well, Swansea University's second innovation campus, of course, one of the largest knowledge economy developments in, in the UK, which I, I, I know before the member for Aberavon uh, points out to me is in uh, his constituency, but nevertheless, of course, is an important driver for, for uh, both neighbouring constituencies and beyond, of course. We have the Trinity St David SA1 Innovation uh, Quarter. That is estimated to contribute more than £3 billion to the regional economy over the next uh, 10 years. We have specific based, of course, at Swansea University, collaborating with Tata Steel, with NSG Pilkington and Axo, no Axo Nobel. And that focuses on the generation, storage and release of energy related to, uh, to buildings. And, of course, more widely, the compound semiconductor cluster infrastructure uh, between Cardiff University and IQE and Aberystwyth's uh, Innovation and Enterprise Campus. So we are seeing now the development in a number of universities uh, of innovation and, the example I've given in Bangor, science parks, in order to turn intellectual property and research into jobs. Thank you. Question six, Sean Gwentlian. Yeah. Will the First Minister make a statement on Welsh Government's plans for local government reform? The approach to strengthening local government is under consideration at present. Proposals will be set out in due course. 
Thank you. Here last week, your Cabinet Secretary for Local Government confirmed that he will not proceed with the earlier proposals made to regionalise on a mandatory basis, and to all intents and purposes, his predecessor's proposals are going to be binned, as far as I can see. Is there an agreement within your Cabinet on this fundamental change of direction? Well, the situation hasn't changed as regards the way forward. What everybody accepts, I'm sure, is that we must consider the way in which local government works. Nobody's arguing that the current system is one that works well. And, of course, we want to work with other parties to ensure that the structure is more sustainable ultimately. Question 7, Heaven David. Will the First Minister make a statement on the regulation of estate management companies on unadopted housing estates? Yes, this is one of the areas the Minister for Housing and Regeneration will be looking at as part of a wider review of leasehold and service charge issues. I would like to take the opportunity to commend the Minister for Housing and Regeneration on the work done to minimise uh, leasehold contracts. Um, there is one area where leaseholders actually have more rights than freeholders, um, and that is where leaseholders can challenge what they see as unreasonable uh, service charges by estate management companies. Um, freeholders' rights in this regard are much more limited. Indeed, when a freeholder um, constituent in my constituency emailed uh, an estate management company to complain, they had the email back from the company director of the estate management company telling them to get a life. Um, I'm introducing a member's legislative proposal in this chamber next week to enhance the regulation of estate management companies um, and to strengthen freeholder rights. Um, would the First Minister, I don't expect the First Minister to commit the Welsh Government to support it now, but would the First Minister be willing to meet with me and uh, the Minister for Housing and Regeneration to discuss this um, in advance of next week? Yes, I mean, the, the issue that he raises is an important one because increasingly uh, what I'm seeing is that new housing estates are built and instead of the local authority um, adopting not just the roads but the environment, a service charge is imposed on all residents, even though they own their houses freehold, uh, which they have to pay. Now, it's not clear, yeah, it's not clear, of course, uh, what arbitration mechanisms uh, are in place in order to make sure that the amount paid is reasonable. For some developers, they will insert uh, in the, uh, uh, the contract of, of sale that there will be a particular um, increase in the level specified every few years or so, but that's not universal practice. So I think the member has identified an important point here. Uh, usually we assume that freeholders have um, greater rights than leaseholders, but this is one area where that doesn't uh, happen. If we are to see a situation in the future where more and more housing developers develop houses on the basis that they say to local authorities, look, there's no cost for you, then the issue becomes more acute. Uh, and I'd be more than happy, of course, for discussions to take place uh, with him uh, in order to see how, we, how this can be taken forward. Thank you. Question 8, Janet Finch Saunders. Deal. What steps is the Welsh Government taking to improve public transport services in Wales? Well, we're moving forward with our ambitious vision to reshape public transport infrastructure and services across Wales, including, of course, local bus services following their devolution, uh, rail services through the next Wales and Borders uh, franchise, uh, and, of course, uh, the South East and North Wales Metro projects. Thank you. First Minister, in the past 12 months, the A55 has now been closed 55 times. That, of course, uh, brings about huge delays for our bus services, our commuters, and generally really affects business, our tourism industry, and everything. Can you provide an update on the works to follow the A55 resilience study and confirm how many of the quick wins that have been identified will be carried out? by your government? Well, first of all, the A55 was built to a standard below the standard that will be built now, but it's there and we have to deal with it as it is. What can we do then to, to uh, improve the flow of traffic along the A55? Well, there are two specific uh, projects that I'd refer the member to. Firstly, the removal of the roundabouts in Llanwarbechen and Pen Mai Mal. That uh, work is ongoing. That will, uh, that will help to, uh, to remove, in terms of the design stage, that will help to, uh, to move traffic more quickly. And of course, uh, the work that's being done to uh, look at uh, a third uh, Menai crossing that would turn the A55 into a proper dual carriageway rather than one, uh, having one section uh, where it's reduced to, uh, to, two, to one lane either way. Thank you very much. Question 9, David Rees. 
What discussions have the First Minister had with the UK Government on the devolution of the criminal justice system to Wales? Well, we set forward a coherent approach in the context of the Wales uh, Bill, but the UK Government did not uh, accept those arguments. It is why I have established the Commission on Justice in Wales to provide an expert, independent, long term view. Well, thank you for that answer. And as you say, the criminal justice system is more than just one piece, it is made up of various elements, and one of those elements actually is the prison service. And that's something which I believe should be devolved to Wales. The conclusion from the research into the size of prisons is that smaller prisons have better outcomes than larger ones, both for prisoners and communities. Smaller prisons are very often more effectively run, have lower levels of violence, better staff prisoner relationship, greater focus on resettlement, and better, facil better to facilitate contact between prisoners and their families. In other words, it's, a sport, it's totally better than the larger prisons. And that's supported by the experiences we are seeing in H1P Bearwin at the moment which opened last year, as you know, in Wrexham, is faced substantial problems despite currently holding less than half the prisoners it should hold. Uh, Fifteen fires, 46 cells rendered of use due to damage and three call-outs of the National Tactical Response Group. Clearly, super prisons do not work. Therefore, do you agree with me that super prisons have no future in Wales and that the proposals by the MOJ for the one in Baglan should be withdrawn and the land used for real economic growth, just as the Covenant on it says? Well, the, the member has been um, extremely strong in his view uh, on this, uh, and it is a matter that does not devolve. But, but I will seek to answer some of the questions that he poses. Uh, it, when the Park Prison was opened in Bridgend, in the council ward that I represented, it, was, it, it did not work well. It did not work well for its first few years. There were a number of serious incidents within the prison. It went through prison governors at the rate of knots. Uh, one prisoner escaped by hanging on to the underside of a lorry and was never, never found. Uh, and staff from Swansea and Cardiff had to be uh, brought in to deal with unrest within the prison. Now, that is something clearly that nobody wants to see. But it raises an important point, and it's this. If we get to the point where we are looking to devolve criminal justice, then we need to develop a Welsh penal policy. Uh, I've always argued that you can devolve the police separately, but if you take, um, if you take the, 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 the courts, then you have the probation service, you have the prison service, you have sentencing policy, CPS, it all hangs together. It's all part of the justice system. And it is time, I think, as he rightly points out, for us to, to start the debate on what a Welsh penal policy might look like uh, if criminal justice is devolved. He makes the case uh, for smaller prisons. I've got, I've got no reason to, to doubt what he is uh, putting forward. But I think it's hugely important that he has started a debate on what, a Welsh, what Welsh policy would look like in the event of criminal justice being devolved. Thank you very much. Mr Minister. Thank you. Deal. Item two on our agenda this afternoon is the business statement.